today we're talking about a blue Christmas. I don't know if you guys have ever experienced that in your life. Oops. But uh, blue Christmas. Ever hear with the word blue? Where does it come from? The blues. I got the blues. How many folks enjoy the holiday season? And yeah, how many folks know it's difficult, especially sometimes when you're going through difficult times? Now, where does the word blue come, even come from? Well, actually, it comes from, believe it or not, as a nautical term back in the 1700s and 1800s. What happened was if a captain was at sea or someone died on a high dignitary died on the ship, they would have blue sails to let people know that someone has died. So that's kind of where we got the word blue from. I'm feeling blue. And then, of course, we have blues music, which is awesome. I love blues music. For example, B.B. King and, and Albert King and all that good old stuff. And, and in fact, there's a great song by B.B. King. It says, how blue can you get? He goes, I gave you seven children, and now you want to take them back. How blue can you get? That's a great so we often look at the blues, but how many folks know sometimes it's hard during the holiday seasons? In fact, uh, a lot of people believe this. I heard this for years, but it's not really true. I've heard more people struggle with depression in regards to the serious attributes of that, if you know what I'm saying, between Thanksgiving and Christmas, the more people are depressed, and that's not true. In fact, that's not true at all. Most people struggle in spring till the end of summer. I didn't realize that. But... Christmas still can be a difficult time. For example, for just personally for me, it's a little bit of a difficult time because I'm, I'm having my first Christmas without my mom. And it's hard. And, and going to their house, and my dad's selling his house, and they're getting rid of all my mom's stuff. And, you know, you go to the table, and you're, it's not the same. And some of you know what I'm talking about. And it can be kind of a blue Christmas. They're like, man, this is not really, I don't even want to go to Christmas this year because it's not going to be the same. You start feeling that way. Let me just go someplace else. And maybe you're experiencing that. Maybe it's your first time you had a divorce and now you, it, it, you have to go through this separating the kids and bringing them over here and then the in-laws and the outlaws and your ex is uh, new is trying to outdo your giving and you have all this stress and I don't want to deal with this. This Christmas stuff's for the birds. You get tired of it. Maybe that's you. But do you realize that even in the time of Jesus, it was not exactly everything wasn't as pretty as you think? We often think glory to God in the highest. It was actually glory to God in the lowest. If you think about the Christmas story, and in fact, can I, bust, can I just bust your balloon for holidays? Since we're talking about being blue. Do you know that Jesus was not born on December 25th? More likely it was the spring. Then why do we have it now? Because there are pagan holidays. And they wanted to counteract it with something more positive, which is not a bad idea, by the way. So we're going to take down all of our Christmas decorations. No, we're not going to do that. No. <laughs> the truth is we're celebrating the birth of Jesus, and that's, that's a worthy endeavor, right? It is a worthy endeavor. But it wasn't so easy in that first time of Christmas, if you will, in the time of Christ. Can you imagine being Joseph? You're engaged, and uh, you're engaged to be married to, to Mary. And by the way, the Jewish people were under subjection to the Roman government. In fact, people say that there was the time, the silent years between Malachi and Matthew. There's a span of about 500 years where where's the promised Messiah? Everything's not going as it's called to become and people try to rise up and every time they try to rise up, they're squashed by the Romans and things are not going well. Now you, you're engaged to be married and, and this, this, she comes back to you and says, oh, by the way, I'm pregnant and you know you're not the dad. And she says, it's the Holy Spirit. Say what? <laughs> who? What? The Holy Spirit? Let me know who he is. I'll take care of him. Right? I mean, trying to wondering what, what is going on with that? And then, of course, what happened to Joseph is that God met him in a dream and told him, no, that you're going to call him Jesus and tells him who to call him because the father's role often is to speak into the children's destiny. And that's what Joseph did in many ways. And so that was fine. But imagine Mary... How about Mary's parents? We don't hear about her parents, which I don't really appreciate. Now that I'm a parent, oh, how do the parents feel? They're hearing their, their daughter, what? She's pregnant? It's from the Holy Spirit? Sure it is. Well, she went away to spend time with, her, with Elizabeth six months. I can see reason why. She probably had to leave town. You think gossip is bad now with the Internet? It was even worse back then. Everyone just talked. The whole town knew who she was, Right? 
Back in um, Mosaic law, you could stone her and kill her, but they were under Roman jurisdiction, so they couldn't do that, but you could still find a way to take her out. So there's a lot of shame going around, and, and, and to make matters worse, and, and so maybe Mary and Joseph, they're fine, but no one seems to get it. Have you ever had someone misunderstand you? And your intentions are good, but everyone says you're evil. How does it feel? Not very good. So now they have to, you know, go to Bethlehem, and they're driving in the, in the camel. And, and to make matters worse, Joseph does not make reservations. So Mary asked him, Joseph, did you make reservations? Oh, I forgot. So now they got to stand in a, stand in a feeding trough in a cave. Now, you, the last service was a lot better than you guys are. I'm trying to. But seriously, it was not all that great. It was blue. It was difficult. But sometimes you and I hit things in our lives. It's not just the blues. You see, the blues normally is circumstantial. For example, you know the reason why you're blue because you lost your true love or whatever's going on. There's some situations going on. But sometimes it's beyond being blue because blues are often determined upon circumstances. But what happens when you're hit with depression? And you can't figure out, why am I depressed? Why am I anxious? And it's not just one day or two days or three days, but it goes on for a couple of weeks. And you're despairing living. You don't even want to live. I don't know if that ever happened to anybody, but in fact, it happened in the Bible. And so we're going to be talking about this a little bit. How do you deal with a blue Christmas? And how do you deal with depression and anxiety? And when everything's falling apart, where's God in the middle of this? Look at this verse. Here's the psalmist. You've taken away my companions and loved ones. Darkness is my closest friend. In other words, I have no friends. No one understands what I'm going through. And, and I've known people like my grandfather. He was like 94 or 95. He, he lost all of his friends. All his brothers and sisters were gone, right? Only we were there. That's pretty much it. And so he kind of felt like everyone's gone Everyone I love is gone. Even my dad now is 89. He's got one sibling left. He lost his wife for over 63 and a half years. And now, you know, I feel bad for my dad, and, but he's still pressing on and still finds joy. But it's not easy, right? And, and, and you're going through this, and, and now uh, darkness is your closest friend. What do you do when you can't find hope? What do you do when you go to church and praise God? You're like, no. I don't feel like praising God. I'm depressed. Well, what's wrong with you, brother? Where's your faith? Come on. Name it. Claim it. Grab it. Come on. Success. And you're feeling terrible. What do you do then? When darkness is your closest friend. What does the Bible say about that? Well, we're going to look at this passage of Scripture. Why is it in the Bible? You know why? Because God's a real God. And the reason I believe in the Bible, and for many reasons, is it's real. It shows the frailty of its people in the Bible. Almost everyone in the Bible, without exception, except for a few, maybe Daniel, Melchizedek, and, and that's pretty much, almost everyone else had flaws in their lives, and God still worked through these flawed people. So we're going to look at a psalm, and we're going to look at some, some characteristics we might, can learn from, whether you're going through a blue Christmas or depression or not. How do you handle something like this? And so he goes on and says the following. Let me go back to the other says, a psalm from the descendants of Korah, a song to be sung to the tune, the suffering of affliction. We're going to do that next week, John, <laughs> our worship director. A psalm of Herman the Ezraite. See, this guy's having a hard time, apparently. He's writing a psalm. This is what he says. O oh Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out to you by day. I come to you by night. Hear my prayer. Listen to my cry. Sounds like a good thing, right? But do you realize that in this Psalm, Psalm, 30, uh, Psalm 88 and Psalm 29, there's only two Psalms in the Bible that do not end with hope. Every other Psalm starts with destitute, destruction, difficulty, but by the end, he's praising God. There are two Psalms that do not, 88 and 39, and here is one right now where it's saying he's not having joy at all. In fact, it's getting worse. I'm so glad the Bible is real about these things. It's about real people in real times going through real struggle. 
He goes, oh, Lord, my salvation, I cry out to you by day. I come to you at night. Now hear my prayer. Listen to my cry. For my life is full of troubles and death draws near. I am as good as dead, like a strong man with no strength left. They have left me among the dead, and I am like a corpse in a grave. I am forgotten and cut off from your care. He mentions dead over three times. I feel like I'm dead, and I feel like, God, you do not care about me. God, where are you? It sounds sacrilege. It sounds wrong. How can this be in the Bible? He's theologically wrong. I understand he's theologically wrong. But do you realize that God cares about your suffering? That part of worship is suffering? Do you realize? Let me ask, ask you a question. How many of you have ever learned anything good during good times? How many of you had your biggest life lessons learned and you grew them up much during pain? Dr. Pain. Difficult times. It says, I am forgotten, cut off from your care. It almost sounds sacrilege. You, you, have, you have thrown me. You have thrown me to the lowest pit. Now he's saying, God, hey, God, you're not being fair to me. You're thrown to the lowest pit, the darkest depth. Your anger weighs me down with wave after wave. You have engulfed me. Now, interlude means let it settle. Or sila. For example, if you're watering a plant sometimes, you know, you have to put the water and it has to settle in. It's almost like let this settle in. This is part of worship. You know, it's okay to tell God, God, I'm going through a hard time. God, I don't know why she left me or he left me. I don't know why I had this cancer. I don't know why my mother has this, why I lost my job, why I'm suffering from this depression. God, I don't understand it. Lord, what are you doing? God's okay with you asking him questions. Real relationships have pain. In fact, the people I'm closest to, I've gone through the greatest pain with. In fact, my uncles were fought, fought in World War II and they had people that died. My, my own brother-in-law had to pick up the pieces of his friend who got blown up from a bomb. And he's got friends that are closer, are very close. Adversity often brings people closer. So why wouldn't God want to know your pain? Well, why can't God just take it away? Why can't, we just, why can't he just take it away? I thought, I thought it's wrong to be this sad. Well, hang on, we'll get into that. <clears throat> you have driven my friends away. You have thrown me to the lowest pit, the dark upstairs. Your anger weighs me down with wave after wave. You've engulfed me. You ever feel that way? There's like waves of grief, wave of depression. It's like you swallowed six pounds of Vicks vapor rug in your stomach. And you feel this like, this like cold through your veins and you're depressed. You don't want to get up. You don't want to do anything. And you're like, I just want to die. This is what he's going through. Your anger weighs me down wave after wave. You have driven off my friends by making me repulsive. Now he's blaming God. He's blaming God. He goes, I'm in a trap with no way out of escape. You feel that way? When you're going through depression, guys, listen, often you're in a spiral. You often exaggerate your problems, and all you see is your problems. This is what he's going through. I'm in a trap with no way out. My eyes are blinded by my tears. Each day I beg for your help. Oh, Lord, I lift my hands for you for mercy. Are you wonderful deeds of any use to the dead? Do the dead rise up and praise you? Selah. And then he goes on and says, Can those in the grave declare your unfailing love? Can they proclaim your faithfulness in the place of destruction? Can the darkness speak of your wonderful deeds? Can anyone in the land of forgetfulness talk about your righteousness? Oh, Lord, I cry out to you. I will keep on pleading day by day. You see what he's doing? He's worshiping in his pain. And you may not have the right theology. And sometimes, listen, everybody, when someone's going through depression, the last thing you need to tell them is a sermon. Oh, you're going through depression? What you need to do is you need to have gluten-free dairy snacks <laughs> without dairy and eggs. Then you need to have kale chips and sea salt from the Dead Sea and drink it upside down, and I've been told it will get rid of your depression. Sometimes the best thing you can do, this is a really, the, sometimes the best thing you can do and when someone's going through a hard time is to shut up. Look at your neighbor say, shut up. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm sorry. 
Seriously. Sometimes the best thing you can do when someone's going through pain, Job's friends, the oldest book in the Bible, by the way, the oldest book in the Bible deals with the pain of life. And his brothers, his best friends, were smart enough to say nothing for about two weeks. Then they started speaking, and they started giving him advice. How many of you love unsolicited advice? Praise God. You just got to put praise and worship on. Name it. Claim it. Have it. It's yours. Come on. Come on. Where's your faith? Believe in God. Depression, that's a demon. Let's cast a demon out of you. And they keep casting demons out until you go bold. <laughs> Do I believe in demons? Yes. For sure. But sometimes it's not that at all. You must have some hidden sin in your life. Sometimes we don't know why we suffer. Sometimes we don't know why we're depressed. Sometimes it can be a chemical imbalance. And we judge people. One of my friends, his wife said, who, who got addicted to pain medication when she had a back surgery, suffered great depression. She says, depression is the leprosy of the, of the Bible-believing charismatic church because we're afraid to admit it because we don't have enough faith. Sometimes we go through these things. Sometimes there's pain and you pray and you're asking God for relief and you get none. And you're like, God, what's the use? I, I remember in my early 20s and, and, and everything fell apart in my life. I was engaged to be married, da 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 and it all fell apart. And for a couple of days, I was down. And see, in the past, what I would do is I felt down. I'd go off for a run, watch a movie, have some ice cream, and burn off the calories. Now I have ice cream, and it burns on me. <laughs> oh, I, this is an... <clears throat> can say hi to Sandra. I might spit it at somebody. It might be a projectile going forward. If that happens, just go, just get it out of the way. So in my suffering, my wife comes. <laughs> Why do you reject me? I lost my train of thought, praise the Lord. But you can't find hope in the middle of the darkness. And so I remember what happened to me in the past. I would, you know, go for a run, watch a movie, I'd feel better. But then all of a sudden, there came a time where I didn't feel better for one day, two days, three days, four days. A week went by. Two weeks go by. And I could find no relief. And my God, what is going on? God, where the blank are you? What? Yes. No, I mean blank like, where are you, God? I don't mean swear word. God, where are you? Have you forgotten me? And you start doubting God. You read the Bible, get nothing out of it. You pray, things get worse. Then what do you do? Why do you reject me? Why do you turn your face from me? I've been sick and close to death since my youth. And often when you're going through the spiral, what happens? You get wrong thinking and you make it worse. You see, everybody, there are, sometimes there are situations where you might have a problem with, sometimes there is a chemical imbalance. Sometimes there is, for example, there are people that have diabetes and they have to take insulin. And it, it kind of helps not to have potato chips, right? And, and hostess Twinkies. That, that's kind of helpful. But sometimes you still have to take medication. It doesn't mean you don't have faith. And sometimes the church is the worst about this. I stand helpless and desperate before your terrors. Your fierce anger has overwhelmed me. Your terrors have paralyzed me. They swirl around me like a floodwaters all day. They have engulfed me completely. You have taken away my companions and loved ones. Darkness is my closest friend. One, what can darkness teach us? What do we learn from this? Because sometimes dark things happen. Are there reasons for disobedience? Yes. Could there be demonic activity? Yes. Could it, could it be you don't have a lack of faith? Yes. But sometimes you've done everything right and you still struggle with depression, still struggle with anxiety. What do you do then? See, this is the truth. Darkness, I can't do this. <laughs> Sorry, thank you, honey, but next time, no. Darkness can last a long time, even for a true Christian. Sometimes you're serving God, and you can still be a true Christian and struggle with depression. Uh, you know Jesus dealt with the depression? Yeah, we'll talk about that a little later on. He did. Do you know Jesus dealt with anxiety? Such anxiety that his, that his capillaries broke and it, it mixed with his sweat glands. Do you realize that Jesus said, are you going to desert me as well? 
Jesus understands this. Darkness can last a long time even for a true Christian. So great, what do we do now? Why bother with God? I like what this really, this philosophical movie said. Life is pain, Highness, Princess Bride. Anyone who says differently is selling something. That's a good quote. Life is a pain. Anyone who says differently is selling something. When people tell you, oh, Christianity, it's all going to be good. No, it's not. It's not always. It's actually, it might get worse before it gets better. Aren't you glad you came to church today? <laughs> How many are encouraged right now? <laughs> when people act like, no, it's all going to get better, and then people say, it's not getting better. God must not be real. We're selling a false gospel. In the middle of the pit, God is with me. It doesn't mean I'll never go in the pit. So we have to understand that. You see, darkness can last a long time, even for a true Christian. Also, dark times are the best place to learn about the grace of God. Do you realize, I'm using myself as an example here, because in that, I had to learn to walk by faith, not by feeling. For the longest time, if I felt God, he was there. If he answered my dreams and prayers, he's there. But he's not doing what I've asked him to do. Thank God he did not answer my prayers at that time because I would not be here today, as I mentioned before. But at that time, I didn't know any better. And so I had to learn at that point. This is not about me. I'm just trying to help you understand. But the church was kind of rough with me back then. Come on, have more faith. A couple more services. Let me slap hands on you and push you over until you get it. No, do I believe in the power of God? Yes. But there came a point in time I had to learn to live with the faith that God will get me through this and have different thinking and the circumstances to change things. I love what the commentator said. He says, the very presence of these prayers in Scripture is a witness of God's understanding. God knows how men speak when they're desperate. Jesus knows that as well. Also, dark times can shape greatness. Do you recognize that Abraham Lincoln suffered from, from what we can see, his journals, from acute depression? Yet God used this man to bring a fractured nation back together. One of the greatest leaders of all time, in my opinion, I think the greatest president of the United States, I know some will get some emails after, but it was Abraham Lincoln. He went through a hard time. Dark times can shape greatness. And this is what can begin to happen. You see, and be careful about that. You see, darkness is my closest friend. You know what begins to happen? Remember the story of Job? Job goes to God and says, ah, I know why Job worships you. It's because you got a hedge about him and I can't touch him and everything he has happens. So I'll tell you what, take all of his kids away, take his money his way and see what he does. And God gets rid of his kids, gets rid of his wealth and leaves one, more, one person behind. Guess who it was? His wife. And I think Satan says, no, nah, I'm going to let him keep his wife. Because <laughs> she was nasty. I mean, she says, curse God and die. Do you still have your integrity? Curse God and die. I'm, I'm sure he wished, I wish you would die. She was terrible. She was terrible. And he struggled and struggled and struggled. But in the middle of that difficulty, he worshiped God. In, that div in the middle of that difficulty, he worshiped God. And what happened as a result of that, he came out of it greater. And today, as a result of Job's suffering, we have a book in the Bible which, which helps us to identify. And what he realized, at the end of it all, he realized that the joy that he could have is when he broke out of his earthy sphere and began to understand that God is bigger and greater than his temporary problems, and there's hope beyond hope. But this is what can happen. Even the psalmist understood this. You see, darkness is my closest friend. This defeats Satan. Why? Because it proves the psalmist's faith isn't merely transactional. Is your faith transactional? 
Have we sold you transactional faith? If God puts out for me, then I'll serve him. If he doesn't, I'm not going to serve him anymore. And often we forget that God is working through us a great power and a great strength. We don't always understand why we're being pulverized. But sometimes when the heat comes, the, all the stuff begins to come up. And I can tell you that in recent days, I've had some situations recently because of Christmas and all that. There's been things being pressed and things, things are coming out of me that I don't like very much. And I have to surrender to the Lord. Why? The pressure brings out the junk and submit the junk to God and let God take the junk and make you more beautiful. It's a polishing. It's a polishing that takes place. Suffering can be the crucible for greatness. Take away his blessings. You'll see what begins to happen. You see, when we cling to God in the dark, even when we feel abandoned, it transforms us. It makes us unshakable. When you hold on to God in your darkest days and you say, God, I'm going to trust you. Though you slay me, I will trust you. God, you're my source. Not my husband, not my girlfriend, not my school, not my job, not my health. God, you're my source. Not the country, not a president, not a political party. God, you're my source. And I'm going to trust you, God. The Bible says we have this treasure. This is the Apostle Paul in jars of clay to show the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. He says, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life that Jesus may be manifest in our bodies. The Apostle Paul said, when I'm weak, he is strong. Now, no one wants to hear this kind of sermon. I want to hear four ways to be happy and gracious and be full of riches and anointing. That's not what you want to hear. I want to have my best life now. And if he doesn't give me my best life now, I'm going to a different church, and I'm going to run after until I find that hope, of, that, that joy I'm looking for. I'll run from church to church, preacher to preacher. But Pastor, isn't there some good news here? No. <laughs> there is good news. You see, that Jesus may be manifest in our bodies. You see, darkness can last a long time, even for a true Christian. And dark times are the best place to learn about the grace of God. And dark times can shape greatness. And darkness is not permanent. This is the key, my friends. There was a great pastor named Donald Greg Barnhouse was a Presbyterian pastor in Philadelphia a number of years ago, and this was a while ago, and unfortunately, his wife died, and he had toddlers and young children, and while he was going to the funeral, coming back, I'm not quite sure, but he was trying to console his children what was going on, and they saw a truck, and with that truck, there was a shadow of a truck, and he asked his son, son, would you rather be hit by the truck or the shadow of the truck? And his son piped up and said, the shadow. He goes, Jesus was hit by the truck so you could be hit by the shadow. Jesus took it all, and I quote, because Jesus was hit by the truck of death, you only had to go through the shadow of it. This thing of death is sin, and the poison went into Jesus. Jesus took the blow so you and I would not have to. We face a shadow, not the direct hit. That's the hope. We have hope. There is light at the end of the tunnel. Depression, anxiety, struggle, it is only temporary. Jesus took the hit so you and I can overcome. And we have to understand that. You see... God looked away from Jesus. I don't know if you understand this or not. But Jesus, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all three in one. They were always were and always will be. There is no time with God. He's beyond time, before time, and after time. He's the Alpha and Omega. He always was. 
Can you imagine being with God forever and ever? You're one entity, and all of a sudden, he gets sliced off from God. He's by himself, and the Bible says, he quotes Psalm 22, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? For the first time in all of eternity and beyond eternity, he was separated from the Father, and he felt alone and destitute and separate and depressed, and all hope was gone. Jesus knows your pain. The Bible says in, in Hebrews, he was tempted in every way like you and I are. But what happened? For the joy set before him. In Hebrews chapter 11, 12, he endured the cross. Why? He knew what was going to come after. But he experienced the destitute. Darkness is not permanent. For I know my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God. The Apostle Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, righteous judge, will give to me, on that day, not only to me, but all who have longed for his appealing. Listen, everybody, life is tough. Christians sometimes go through depression. Does it mean we give up on God? No. It means we seek God's grace. Every good and perfect gift comes from him. Can God heal people of depression? Absolutely. Can God heal people of, of anxiety? Absolutely. Can God heal people of cancer? Absolutely. Uh, I don't understand why he does and why he doesn't, but I, my default setting is to believe God is my healer. The Bible says, my God shall supply all of your needs. The Bible says, bless the Lord all your soul who heals all of your diseases and forgives all of your sins. By his stripes we are healed. But the question is, when are we healed? I don't always know. But we can't let our experience write our theology. We have to let the word of God write our experience. And this is what happens. I had a friend of mine a number of years ago told me this. The problem with you charismatic Pentecostal types is you expect too much from God, and then you're disappointed. He goes, whoops, I didn't say that. <laughs> yes, you did. That's exactly right. If God doesn't heal today, we're not with the apostles. If God doesn't do this anymore, then I won't be disappointed by God. I'm going to let my experience write my theology. No, 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 no. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. We have to stand on the rock of God. I don't want this disease. I don't want this depression. I don't want what's happening in my life. But I, though he slay me, I will trust him. The best is yet to come in Christ Jesus. You've got to believe that. You've got to see that. You've got to know that. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. The best days are always ahead for those in Christ Jesus. You see, what happens is, get, stop getting hit by the truck and let the shadow of death, though I go through the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. God is with you in the dark. God is with you in the light. Your emotions are lying to you. Believe the word of God over your emotion, over your circumstances, and be a real man and be a real woman and say, I don't like what's going on, but I'm going to white knuckle this roller coaster ride because I know I'm strapped in and I know I feel like I'm going to die. I'm not going to die. I'm going to live in Christ Jesus. So, my question to you today is this Are you going to believe the word of the Lord? or the word of your emotions, or the word of your circumstances. Listen, to everybody, we know who wins. We fight from victory. Even though we're in despair, we know he cares. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you so much that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. I want to thank you, Father, that you're close to the brokenhearted, that no matter what we're going through, you understand it, Jesus. 
that you were tempted in every way as we were. You faced separation. You faced emotions that we would never, ever have to face. You faced the ultimate separation anxiety. You faced the ultimate depression. And Lord, you overcame it and you became a curse for us that we no longer have to have the gravity of the sin. We only have to have the shadow of the sin. And Lord, we thank you that if we give our lives to you, the best days are ahead. And we thank you, you're the God that still heals. So, Lord, I pray for healing right now in Jesus' name. Lord, I ask, I pray, God, that you would just eradicate depression on people right now. Anxiety in Jesus' name. Father, seasonal depression would go away. Father, cancer would go away. Lord, multiple sclerosis would go away. Lord, arthritis would go away. Lord, you are bigger and you are greater than any of our diseases. And we will not bow down to any disease and give it precedence over you. We will worship the Lord Almighty God above our problems, above our pain, because you have overcome. And we will reign with you forever and ever and ever. And Lord, we choose to believe your word in Jesus' name. Father, thank you that you promised you would never leave us or forsake us. And Lord, I pray for special grace. We thank you there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Father, we come against guilt and condemnation for those that have given their lives to you. We pray for healing, even right now, Lord, healing. You're the same God. Lord, I think I've seen people get healed right here in our services, hearing coming back, depression dropping off. Lord, you're the same God. We ask for miracles right now in Jesus' name.